Okay, everyone. I must warn you, if you're easily scared by phantoms or if you're offended by dark stories, now is the time for you to stop and exit this tour of Manor House. Otherwise, you enter at your own risk. Discretion is advised. Visit manorhouseshow.com and sign up for the RIP section where you'll receive Manor House exclusives not found here or anywhere else. Your plot is waiting for you. And if you've made it out alive after tonight's tale, you will still have the option of renting a room for the night here at Manor House. It'll be an experience you'll never forget. Tonight's tale is The Bosun's Whistle by A.P. Sessler. A resident of North Carolina's Outer Banks, A.P. Sessler searches for that unique element that twists the everyday commonplace into the weird. When he's not writing fiction, he composes music, dabbles in animation, and muses about theology and mind hacking, all while watching way too many online movies. His short stories have appeared online at Human Echoes Podcast and Acidic Fiction, as well as print anthologies such as Zippered Flesh 2, Dandelions of Mars, Illusions of Innocence, Starquake 2, and Cranial Leakage. Follow me. The Phantom Collector awaits. Welcome. Come in. Don't be scared. At least, not yet. I just received my monthly shipment of coffins. I mean, beds. I have to make sure the guest can rest in peace while they stay here at Manor House. These beds come from Europe, and they're delivered here by a ghost ship from my favorite courier service, Dead X. That ship is not unlike the ship we're going to hear about in tonight's Crazed Chronicle. On that ship, Captain Dale's crew has a new hand on deck, and it isn't a human one. Nobody knows about it until now. Ship ahoy, mateys. We're going out to sea. Gather round. Look into the light. Look. Look deep. Open your imagination. And listen to the story called The Bosun's Whistle.
Eight bells, the Yonker rang bright and true that sunny morn, for twas the afternoon watch. Bosun Jim sounded pipe down on his whistle, sending those topside to the rest betwixt decks and calling us below to come topside. Twas old Carlisle, the ship's carpenter, who was first topside. He let out a great yell, and by the time I made it topside, all I saw was every man's back. Aside, I says, parting the wall of men asunder, till I beheld the commotion. Carlyle, with his great big arms, had Bosun Jim by the shoulders, and durst not let him go. Any man who tried to pull Carlyle off of him caught the back of his hand. Let him go, Carlyle. Nay, Master Scrim, it's not what you think. I won't ask again. But Carlyle picks old Jim off his feet like he's fixing to throw him overboard. And that's when I took my cudgel to the back of his head. Sure enough, he drops Bosun Jim and hits the deck. What is this, Master Scrim? Says Captain Dale, coming up from behind like. Carlisle attacked Bosun Jim. I won't suffer fighting on my ship. What was it over this time? I'm fixing to find that out, Captain. Very well. Make her inquiry and let me know what she discover. Aye, Captain. What do ye want I should do with Carlisle? Your quartermaster. I don't have to tell ye your job. The men waited on my word. Put him in shackles and take him betwixt decks. And fetch me when he comes to. Whilst they dragged him off and every man goes about his business, I took to questioning Bosun Jim. What was that all about? He ignored me, so I repeated my words. He just looks at me, then turns his head. I took that to mean he was in no mood to discuss what happened. Whilst that would not suffice for a proper trial, he had work to do, so I let him be, for the time, and tried my luck with the Yonker, a lad named Willem. What did you see, lad? And don't hide a thing, for I'll know if ye do. Ye have to speak to the Yonkers like so. Not a thing, I swear, Master Scrim. I had me back turned the whole time I sounded the watch. Got no wish to look a man in the eye lest I'm speaking with him as we do now. I could see he told the truth. You did good, lad. Now back to work. The only soul left to question was the man who committed the act. So as I made my way betwixt decks to see if Carlisle had come too. I found him there, laying all still, his ankles in fetters, his wrist as well. Steward Tom had been watching him the while. Fetch some water. It's about green, Master Scrim. I don't mean to drink it. So he poured a tankard of sour water and gives it to me. I emptied the tankard over Carlisle's face. He twitched a bit, spit it out, then he comes to. <coughs> Master Scrim, Master Scrim, you have to believe, I saw it with mine own eyes. The sea monster, it came up portside just when Bose and Jim sounded pipe down. The monster shook him till he dropped that whistle, then throws him straight overboard. Then why is Jim standing there, eyeing our every move? Twas his whistle it wanted. Why would it want a whistle, man? The same reason a fish wants a hook. How should I know? I'm a man, not a fish. But that Bose and Master Scrim... That bosun. I've heard enough, man. Give him a quart of your strongest drink. But Master Scrim... Do it now. We can't have him scaring the men. Stuart Tom hated to waste the ration, but it was the only way to silence the madman. Had to have force him to drink it, for he wouldn't shut up about the monster or the whistle. He was out cold soon enough, though. If he goes on like that when he comes to, shove another quart down his gullet. Aye, Master Scrim. What if he speaks the truth? Concerning? She monsters. Twas merely his poor excuse for half killing Jim. Bosun Jim must have been in a particularly good way with the Lord, for he turned the other cheek. He chose not to return evil for evil. Can't say I would have done the same. Well, I certainly didn't. Then I'll give him more of the same if he steps out of line again. 
What do you want I should do if he doesn't fight you? Undo his shackles and let him go. Aye, Master Scrim. I returned topside. Every man was busy with his task, as if nothing had happened. That's how you run a ship. You can't stop working any more than you can drop anchor in the middle of the sea just cause there's a commotion. I gave Jim a look-see. He was quiet as a church mouse. Still, I had orders to discover the matter concerning he and Carlyle's contention. Oh, son Jim, a moment if you don't mind. Oh, son Jim, the captain would like to know why you and Carlyle had words this morning. The man doesn't even look at me. Not a blink, not a sigh, nothing. With him holding his peace like he did, I had no choice but to return to my business. Albeit, for the remainder of the watch, I did observe his queer silence. The man didn't move an inch. Perchance he suffered from sunstroke. Or perchance he did see the monster Carlyle spake of. Now that would make a saint out of a sinner. Shut a man's mouth like Joe before the Lord. Four bells rang. Twas an emptiness, a hollowness to their sound. Twas also the first dog watch. Half of us ceased from our labor as we awaited Bosun Jim's call for supper. But no call came. Those still to work paid no mind, but us ready to be relieved, not a little and hungered, cast our impatient eyes at him, then Captain Dale. When the captain was privy to our plight, he meant to remedy the situation. Bosun, call for supper. Bosun? Have you forgotten your task? Says Captain Dale, some kind of furious, for he took Bosun Jim by the collar and shook him half silly. Then a queer thing happened. Jim's jaw dropped wide open, and a deep sound comes forth, like a mooring line pulled tight. It went on and on, unceasing, like his lungs needed nary a breath. His hand grew long, and suckers popped out of his fingers and palms, and wrapped right around the horrified captain's throat. <laughs> a Portuguese by the name of Sebastian, a whaler, took one of his spears and ran it through Jim's side. That monstrous tentacle let right go of the captain. Then Sebastian rendered a second blow, at which Jim dropped his whistle. The metal pipe rolled along the deck, aglow in the sun. Then Bosun Jim's form changed, clothes and all. I saw his jerkin, shirt and breeches become as the flesh of an octopus. I knew it was such, for it had eight tentacles. It stood on half of them, as a man does his legs. The crew circled it and backed it against the port side rail. It lashed at them with its suckered whips, drawing great whelps of blood anywhere it struck. One poor soul's cheek was filleted to the bone. Not shrinking back, the man ran upon the beast and heaved it over, but it laid hold of the rail and stanchions before it could reach the water. Stirred by the great commotion, the hired mercenaries betwixt decks came up from the rest, with Callum the Scot leading the charge. In an instant, six swords were drawn and ready to run the monster through. With a blinding flash of sun, Callum struck his sword at a tentacle, cutting it in twain where it clung to the rail. The severed thing fell to the deck beside the bosun's whistle, the limb twitched most unnaturally as it changed form, from tentacle to a man's hand, and back to tentacle again, all the while reaching for that damned silver pipe. It was then I lost sight of what happened, 
for the crowd ebbed and flowed like the sea itself, charging, retreating to and fro. I spun around to see above the crowd and was certain I saw tentacles creeping over starboard. Had the creature moved so swiftly? A great yell pierced the noise from behind me. I spun around to see one of Callum's band taken by the throat in one of those tentacles about to go overboard. Another tentacle grabbed his right arm and shook it till his sword fell loose. I heard the clank of it as it hit the deck. Again the crowd moved about me and spun me around so as that I lost sight of the monster and man. When the crowd broke again, I saw Callum strike at another tentacle, but it let loose the port side rail. The suckered arm shot right for me. I leaped half out of my skin to avoid it when I saw what it was reaching for. For at my feet lay the bosun's whistle. It laid claim to its prize. Then the creature dropped, whistle and all, into the sea. With a great splash, the thing vanished from our sight into the depths. Where that morn, it surely dragged Jim to his death, as Carlyle said. With all the madness at bay, and every soul counted for, we settled back into our work. Though we were might disturbed by that we witnessed, each soul played the man and did his task. There was little talk the rest of the watch, and when it ended, a dread silence settled in the absence of the bosun's call. The yonker rang four bells, the second dog watch, and on my honor, I swear, they were church bells for a funeral. It could not have sounded more so than if we stood on hallowed ground at the cemetery gate. Looking up from the weather deck, the captain's binnacle looked like a church steeple against the gray sky. It gave me a wicked fright. We retired between decks for our meats, and upon my request, Captain Dale let the spirits flow freely. After such an ordeal, it seemed only fitting to let each man drink as much as he will. And drank we did, from the finest tankards, brass and silver, and ate from likewise plates, verily fit for gentlemen. The whole galley was aglow, but nothing but candlelight and gleaming metal and filled to the rafter with all manner of merrymaking. Even old Carlyle, when he came to, and we made peace, gave in to our celebration. Every man seemed himself, and the evil we saw forgotten. Even if, for but a time, every man, that is, save one of Callum's band. He it was I could have sworn I saw in the monster's grip, yet there he sit in the flesh, I watched him sitting in that corner, not taking part in the evening's mirth, quite enamored with his sword, which he dare not sheath. He just kept turning it back and forth, watching the candlelight bounce off the blade, the same light that sparkled from each man's metal dish. My eyes were heavy. I needed to sleep. I've heard of sea sickness before, but that was completely out of this world. At least the crew was able to get rid of the creature. Or were they? 
that one fellow in the corner seemed a bit fishy, as if he was going to cut in on the fun. I hope you enjoyed tonight's tale. Until the next one, won't you stay the night? <gasps>